All right, you'll need to help me to share my screen. Okay. I know I can't share my screen. You'll have to enable that. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Got it. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we can. Yep. Thank you. Perfect. All right, so just a bit of a recap on what we saw before. Uh, we were looking at four major items that we're talking about today is what is change management. We went through that. We kind of understood a little bit on what change is in the brain. Uh, so when we come to the end with some questions, I'd like to see if you have any questions at that time. I will open up for questions and you can then ask. Uh, we'll then jump to the Kubler-Ross change curve. Now, what is the Kubler-Ross change curve? So Kubler-Ross was a person. And it was, um, it, it, it's a change curve that she derived. You know, it, it's a variation model. It's an application of the uh, various concepts that she's learned and studied. And she put this change together for the process of death or process of dying. And that's the only way that people run through change in their head. That's the only thing that runs through. So I'd like, let me move to the Prezo. All right. All right, the Kubler-Ross change curve. So whenever your mind goes through any change, whether it rather it be, or this is specifically in offices, and we're talking about corporates and how you can apply what you learn here in your corporate life when, when you take that step in the next couple of years, depending on which year you're in. Um, so whenever any change happens, you need to understand that people go through this change in their mind. And this is the curve that they go through. Shock, denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and implementation. We start off with shock where there's, well, of course, you understand what shock is. So there's like, okay, wait, they pause at that moment because they want to understand what happened. So there's a pause. And then after that, you've got the initial, um, either it could be excitement or it could be denial. So it depends on the kind of change. You're either happy about something or you are sad about something. So you either say you deny it or you're pretty enthusiastic or motivated in that. So once you pass that, you go into the uh, anger stage, which is where you start slipping into, if you see this curve, right, this curve here, it's called the valley of despair. Now, the value of despair is a very important part because somewhere here on here is where you find a balance. So if you slip into this curve, which happens a lot, this is where a lot of people have issues nowadays personally and uh, professionally. What happens is they slip into this curve and they just stay here. They don't come up. Now, it could be one with a lack of... Um, guidance. It could be too that they don't have proper connections and contacts. So that's why you'll stay in the valley of despair. Now in an organizational setup, what I work with, my main goal is I cannot stop people from going into anger and depression. That is going to happen whether I like it or not. But what I aim to do is to bring them out of that as quick as possible. So the idea is to bring them from depression which is bound to happen. There's no way you can pass that. And that's where you'll see your initial resistance. That's where you'll see stubbornness, complaining, anxiety, stress. Um, they will not want to look at the positive outcome. Everything that they will bring up is a negative outcome. That's when they are in anger and depression, right? There's, there's always negative questioning. No one will, and at that point, they will stop asking you as to what is good, but they will start asking you as to example, I'll give you an example what I'm going through right now. We are changing um, the entire software, which is which is the back end software of a share trading company. Now this is linked with people who are called advisors. Now advisors, they manage clients. So they are asking us saying, okay, we want we've been using XYZ report. Uh, we want that. But they're not talking about what we're giving them, which is better, which is in the next two years would be probably one of the best systems in terms of a backend that there is in the market. But that's a point where they will pick on the negative questioning or they would doubt your intentions. They will start doubting um, 
uh, why this has to come in. We were happy with what we had previously. Why does this need to come in? Why do we need to change? At this point in time is when you reinforce. Now reinforce happens with communication. Reinforcing happens with a lot of activities. Reinforcing happening happens with a lot of positive motivation. This is where you need to put, get your you know, feet wet and push these people out of depression into a bargaining stage. Now a bargaining stage is a very, um, bargaining is one word. Another word that we could use is exploration. So you need to get them out of resistance, which is depression, and into an exploration slash bargaining uh, world where they are more energized, they are creative, they are overworked because mind you, they are doing the old and they are being asked to learn the new at the same time. So there's more work, but they are happy about it, but they are bargaining saying that, yes, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel in this one, right? So this is where you talk about what is in it for them. When you're running a change program for a company, yes, it's important to tell them what it means to the company. Yes, it's important to tell them what it means for a customer, but people are selfish, right? There's no two ways about that. Everyone wants to know what is in it for me. So if I am changing, what's in it for me? What do I benefit from it? So this is the point when you bring up all the benefits that you have for that per particular person or group of people. Now, how I would work that is I would talk to them about how their skill set would improve. Like if you know how to use, uh, example, you've used, been using Tally before and now you're learning SAP, you now have a skill that the market really wants. So that's a motivation factor for that person personally. So you need to bring out that importance of and give each one their importance and that's when you can bring them out of that depression. Move to exploration and then go finally into the implementation stage or which I also like to call commitment stage. That's where you go back to being enthusiastic. You go back to being excited. You go back to being clear and you have focus on what you wanna do or what you have to do. And there's a lot of problem solving that happens at this stage. Problems that could have arised, um, oh, sorry, problems that could have arose back in anger and depression but you didn't know an answer because your mind was more stuck on being negative and uh, you were being stubborn, but now you're more in a stage where you're committed to what you wanna do. And the success for a change project is not ending the project where everyone knows what to do to use a system. Now, example, if I say an SAP implementation, the success is not gained by, all right, on that day, we, everyone knows SAP. Everyone will not know SAP for a long, long time. What we need to achieve is that they've accepted SAP or they've accepted the change. Now that's the important part, right? And that's how we look at change in terms of its importance and how we look at the success factors. So I'm gonna jump quickly now to the next. Now, uh, please note, I mean, jot on your questions and I will ask, I'll open up for questions in probably in about 15 minutes and then we can, you know, go through questions that you have. So, um, we jump to the next, the last point that I have to share with you guys today is the four principles of change. Uh, of course, there's multiple, you can list multiple principles, but I feel the four principles of change that, I, that work for me and work for a general set are these four right? Change, you need to understand that change registers as pain in the brain. If you understand this part, then it's easier for you to help them navigate and understand that, hey, they are perceiving this as pain. And you need to understand that whatever you do needs to alleviate their pain. If you're not working with that, then you're not going anywhere. You're just going to have a lot of enemies. Because as a change manager, if you become, if you decide, and I'll, and I'll, I'll explain after this topic, how you can become a change manager if you want to, and if this is something that interests you. Um, I'll, I'll give you some hints and tips as to how you do that. But these four points are more of your bread and butter when you attack a change progress, uh, sorry, a change project, right? So the first thing you need to understand, as I said, change registers as pain in the brain. You need to understand that. You, you cannot go away from the fact that they are struggling through that current problem. They are definitely struggling and it's not something that it's that is a personal thing. It is a human thing. 
It's not something that David is bad at, or it's not something that, um, I'm just picking up names here, Fiona is bad at. It's nothing to do with a personal uh, connection here. It is all human beings. Human beings react this way, and this is where, where we are. We are hardwired to go a certain way, and that's how we will, right? Second is your expectations shape reality. Now, as a change manager, what you do is you don't, you don't give them lies. It's a very important thing that you don't tell them, okay, this is gonna work, this is gonna change your world. No, most of the times, whatever you're changing for them, it could be a culture change, it could be um, a software change, it could be a system change, it could be multiple changes. It's not going to you know, be the best thing that they've ever done. If you keep saying that, you're building an expectation there. And if your change delivers here, it's gonna fail. Uh, there are a lot of examples of companies that started change programs, which were supposed to be done in six months, but took 12 years and did not complete their change program simply because their expectations were not set correctly. Set your expectations. They should be as close to reality as possible. Like don't, don't promise someone the stars, right? But if, if you're giving them the stars, then it's fine. If you can deliver, perfect. But if you, if you know that a product is only going to reach eight. Be honest. Honesty is some is an emotion that every human being will um, accept. And after honesty, you, that's then you gain trust. When you're honest with someone, the next step is trust. And once you have someone trusting you, you will breeze through any change project without any trouble at all. Because then they have a personal connection. They are emotionally connected with you. And then whatever you say, they will understand and will believe which is why you need to make sure that whatever you say is correct and to the point, right? So expectations shape reality. Make sure that you set the right expectations and not something that is in the clouds. Third, change is a process. We went through the Kubler-Ross process, right? The whole change curve. You cannot jump from denial straight to commitment. That is not going to happen. The human brain doesn't work that way. So the only way you can go from A to Z, or in this case, from shock to access, uh, commitment or involvement is you need to go through the process. And some people go through the process quickly. Some people take longer. The idea as a change manager is you need to understand where that person or group of people are and then go with that. Now, if, you, if you've understood people, if you've, uh, I mean, I don't know how many of you are majoring in HR in this group, but if you've understood that people like, um, like to be in groups, right? Um, if, now example, if I'm asking, hey, hey, ask for questions, I'm sure that there'll be more questions after the first two people ask, right? People get a little more comfortable in a group, in a, say they don't like to be singled out. Now, you use that aspect of humanity and use it to the change process where you have someone called a change catalyst or a change analyst or a change champion, how we call it. So I have my ally, which is if I'm changing a team, I will pick one person from the team and make them understand the whole process first and bring the importance of the change to them. And then they will go and spread that to the team. And that's how the team comes up to a level that we want them to. If I'm attacking the team head on with no ally inside, I'm setting up myself for failure, right? So the importance is you all need to understand change. You can do a lot of reading. You can do tools till you're blue in the face. But if you don't understand that you are dealing with human beings, you are not going to succeed in your change process. So just step back. Change is just as pain in the brain. Expectations shape your reality. Change is a process. Do not fight the process. Go with the flow, right? And finally, the last thing, your difference between the, now, you have pain, you have expectations. The last point is the difference between these two are what determines the level of pain. So if your expectations are really far from reality, then your pain is higher. But if your reality is closer to your expectations, which means if you've promised them number 10 and you've given them nine, then the probability of them being more accepted, accepted is, is higher. 
Whereas if you promise someone 10 and you give them six, now that's gonna increase their pain, right? So these are the four principles. So I'll give, why don't you take up a 30 day challenge, right? Take up a 30 day challenge for yourself and change something. It could be anything. I mean, uh, when, when the, when the, when the um, lockdown started, uh, I said, you know what? I wanna change something in myself. And I started learning to write with my left hand. I've always been a person who writes with my right hand. So I started to teach myself to write with the left. And in about 25 days, I was able to write a sentence in my left hand. But it was really difficult, really, really difficult. At the first day was hard, second day was even worse. So take up a 30 day challenge for yourself. And if we do have another session, and if you folks are on that session at some point in time, in, the, in, in, in probably the next month or two, Share that with, uh, with me if you can, or share it with your friends, share it with this group. If you're a general group, share what you've done. The only way to stick to a plan is to share it, right? The reason why a lot of people um, are, uh, there's, there's a sense of belonging that happens when you share. So share what you start a 30 day challenge. I don't know, Tony, so Tony, so you can probably set up a challenge for them and track it if they want to. Um, probably in the next couple of days, I'll give you a little form that you can fill that you, that you can send to them to understand for themselves to do an assessment to understand if they are someone who loves change or hates change, All right? I'll give you that as well. So you can, you can do a bit on that. So, Moving forward, um, you must have heard, you know, strongest survives, or uh, you must have heard uh, Darwin say the, you know, the the species that is the strongest survives, like you know, the survival of the fittest. But this is also something that Darwin said that it's not the species that survives or thrives. Thrive. It's not the strongest. If it was the strongest, then elephants would have been the only ones roaming the earth, or mammoths, which are now extinct, would be on the earth. Right? It is the most intelligent and the ones most resilient to change. I'll give you a very brief example here. Uh, I'm sure you've all been to a circus, right? Uh, of course, now they don't have circuses where they have uh, elephants. So if you've seen an elephant which is tied by a chain to its leg, right? the important thing with that is that elephant is strong to pull down the entire tent of the circus. That chain will be tied to one peg which goes on the ground. That elephant can remove that in two seconds, but it doesn't. You know why? Because right from the time that that elephant was a really tiny baby, it was chained and it learned that it cannot escape. So this is a lack of intelligence, knowing that your, your strength or your intelligence increases, right? So remember this one thing, you need to be, if you wanna survive in the corporate market, you need to be able to accept change that's coming in. All right, that's all I had for today. If you have any questions, I'm opening it up now. And post this, we'll do a couple of, um, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you some tips on what next, how to improve your learning on change. And yeah, at, at some point, if you wanna even look at opportunities, either within the country, outside the country, how do you make that? I'm happy to share that as well. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm going to take away my, uh, I'm going to stop sharing at this moment. I request participants to post any questions if they have in the chat box. Okay, I can see we've got, Tony says, we can learn, okay, <laughs> we learn from children, nothing wrong in anything knowledge. Children teach us better. Very true, very true. You know, it's important that you, there's a difference. Uh, there's always, it's always nice to be childlike and not childish. There's a big difference between those two words. So if your childish is, is different, is behaving like a child, but being childlike, which means that you believe in something and you, build, and you know that you can achieve it, that is being childlike. So the next question I have is from Sonali Madad says, if you, can, if you say the brain can shut down and follow a pattern and not use much brain power, uh, okay, this goes back to the second point. And driving is a habit, okay. Why do we find it difficult to talk or have a proper conversation? Okay, that's a very good question. So, so Sonali says, um, like when I said the brain can work without any power and shut down and use the balance for something else. Uh, Sonali says, okay, why can't we have a conversation or talk when driving? You, you can't because 
although driving is a habit, like you, you, you know what gear to change, you know when to change the gear, it's a habit. But what is not a habit or what is new is what's coming on the road, right? The car that's passing you is not, it's, it's not constant. It's a change in pattern. You're driving a different road. You're driving with different cars on the road. There's different amount of traffic on the road. So there's a change in pattern, right? So pattern is everything for change. If you change the pattern, you can change something in, inside of you. I'll give you an example here. If um, it, it's, not, it's not an amazing example, but uh, I'll use it. So a smoker, if a smoker wants to give up smoking, right? The best way to do it is give up smoking when you're on a vacation. When you go away for a week or you go away for two weeks, give up smoking there. Because what the brain does, it's, it's brain loves patterns. The brain loves, if a smoker smokes every morning and wakes up and says, has a cigarette, that's a pattern. So every morning, if he wakes up and looks at his surrounding is the same, he will go straight for a cigarette and light it up. But if he goes for a vacation, example, wakes up in a different room altogether and there's no cigarette next to him, it will be hard. The first few days will be really difficult, but if you wanna break a habit, you need to change the pattern change your atmosphere, change your, change what's around you to change the pattern, to, to change your habit. So that's the question. All right. Uh, changing often is good or bad? It depends. Uh, <laughs> change is always, change is X. You can be a bad change. Uh, learning to smoke is a bad change. Um, so it depends on what your outcomes are. It's always based on your outcome. Change uh, in, in a good sense is very good because when you are stagnant, when you are in a, the same pool, you tend to get comfortable. You tend to get very comfortable. Your learning stops, which is why you don't have the same subjects happening every day. You don't have three or four lectures of the same uh, lecturer coming in. If I know even if you, have, you enjoy a certain lecturer giving you a lecture, it, it's not easy, easy right? Um, hello, can you please give me tips on accepting the change while in abroad? Okay, accepting a change when you move. I'm, I'm guessing that's what your question is, Aishwarya. So when you move, uh, the most difficult thing is when you move abroad or you even move, the example, you're, you guys are in KGF, most of you, uh, you'll move to um, Bangalore at some point in time for work. That's a massive change because you're moving from your family. You're moving from a place you had your support system. You're moving from a place where you know you can get up and go to that shop. You can get milk, you can get biscuits, you can get chocolates, you can get whatever. And on the way, you've got friends. You, it's a pattern. It's, it, it's, it's perfectly normal for your brain. But you take that away, put you in a hostel or put you in your aunt's house or put you in a rented house in Bangalore or anywhere else in the world. It's a complete change of pattern. You feel vulnerable. But that's a very important phase. Vulnerability will help you to grow. That's when you learn. You will not learn until you're vulnerable. I learned how to cook when I had no one to cook for me. Until then, my mom was cooking as long as I was with my mom. She used to cook whatever, and, and I used to enjoy it. So you need to become vulnerable. You need to become, um, you need to be in a spot where you're not comfortable. And that's where change happens. That's where the magic of change is. So in, in give you tips on accepting the change while abroad, there's no tips. The tips are try and acclimatize yourself as quick as possible. As quick as possible, you need to get, so if you used to like walking back in your hometown or back uh, home, start walking again. If you like the gym, start doing things that you're used to, even though it's a new atmosphere, it's fine, but start doing what you are used to before and slowly your mind will start accepting the change that you're there. Uh, David, okay. All right. So for management students abroad, so Tony says saying, David, tell the opportunity. So, oh, you're welcome, Ashwarya. My pleasure. Um, so opportunities with change. Now, what you're doing now is probably the first step that is a pretty important step for change management. You can't go straight. You can't learn change management initially, right? What you can do is stick with what you're doing right now with your, which is your BBM or BBA, where you learn the basics. And then from there, you progress in learning how to work with a team. You can't lead people until you learn to work as a team. So work with a team. And then probably yeah, you sh if, if you want to pursue it as a higher, higher course, do your master's. Your master's in, uh, you can do it in, in HR. You can do it in international business. 
multiple things you can do your master's in. And then you could jump into change management as well. Change management is not a course you can take initially. You need to have uh, X amount of years, like your PMP. So to do a project management certification, you need to have at least about 4,000 or 4,500 hours of project management uh, work experience. So it's the same with change. You can't become certified until you've worked a certain amount. So stick to what you're doing. You're doing the right thing you've, by you know, doing management. There's, there's a host of courses there. Change management is, is one of the hottest things right now because um, the world is changing. And now it's moving from change management. We're now starting to call it agile change management because there's more changes happening every day. Yeah. All right, last question. Um, as you told, you need different atmosphere and environment to change, but the change should come from within yourself for the betterment. Is that a question or is that a comment, Saeed? I'm not very sure if you're trying to ask me a question or if you're just stating a comment. But if you're stating a comment, you say that the change is for the betterment of yourself. Yes, if you're moving into a new atmosphere and, okay, let me read this again. As you told, you need different atmosphere and environment to change. Not necessarily, you don't need a new atmosphere. It's easier if your atmosphere changes, but you don't necessarily need to have that to change. You, if your willpower is higher, you can change with your existing atmosphere, right? But the change should come from within yourself for the betterment of yourself, correct? So change, it's, it's what happens here, right? If you want it to be easier, you change what's external because you have your five senses, right? You can see, you can smell, you can taste, you can touch, you can feel, sorry, you can, what are the five? It can smell. So all of this, I, I like. I'll give you an example. Whenever I smell certain kinds of food here in Australia, I think of home. I think of back home because it immediately triggers a sense of memory for me. So if you have these triggers, it's easier to change. So uh, probably any, any. Okay, last question. If someone wants to put a question there, I'll answer that question, and then we could call this session an end. I'll give you a minute to type if you're typing. Okay, while you type, um, I would say take that take that challenge of the 30 days seriously and do something. I'm, I'm sure you would amaze yourself. Do something. If you don't know how to ride a bicycle, learn to ride a bicycle. If you and, and you'll you'll understand how the change process goes, because what happens when you change is there's a physical change in your brain, where you actually grow neurons, because for like like your brain is a hard disk, right? Is partly a hard disk. So whenever you do something, it grows brand new uh, neurons. So try and have memories, which is why I urge people have relationships, have good relationships, spend time with your parents, you know, have new memories with your parents, have new memories, with your brothers, your sisters, your friends, you're never going to get that. So we are never going to get the 28th of July 2021 again. It's never going to happen. This moment is not going to happen again. It's going to be a memory. So be more mindful of relationships, people and how that how that works. So happy to have a chat with that as well. Um, if you do want to connect with me, happy to, if you jump on LinkedIn and put my name in, you can connect with me. Uh, happy to chat anytime and share information if you need any. So I don't think 30 days times really works out. I've experienced the change. Thanks. Oh, my pleasure, Dr. Mohan, uh, Sujatha Mohan. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. It was really great listening to your session. Thank you for sharing your experience, valuable inputs, and enriching our knowledge. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Anytime. I hope we'll meet again in September. Yeah, I'm happy to. So probably you could check with the folks that are on this call if they want to go through um, a certification course where we understand the tools that I used. You know, it'll be a much longer session, of course. It'll be more, this is just the tip of the iceberg. But if you want something more meaty, if you want something to learn, then yeah, we could look at that as well at the end of okay. probably in September. Thanks again, sir. My pleasure. Thanks all. Have a lovely, now, uh, what's it, afternoon. Yeah. Now I call upon Ms. Vanisha to conclude the session with a vote of thanks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all. It's really a wonderful speech. Thank you for your excellent presentation today. You managed to deliver sobering statistics in an upbeat and professional manner. 
Here, this is Vinisha, student of BBA, to offer you a vote of thanks. I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this memorable occasion. First and foremost, I thank the Almighty for making this occasion a great success. Then I thank Sri Mahendra Kumar Munod, Managing Trustee, who despite this busy schedule has found time to grace this occasion. I also express my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Rekha Sethi, Principal of SBMJC. We are grateful to our HOD, Mr. Tony Lazarus, for his words of encouragement 